This video is about how to read, draw, and do calculations with a temperature versus heat graph or a temperature versus time graph. This is what a temperature versus heat graph looks like. You can see it has temperature measured in Celsius on the y-axis, that could also be Kelvin, and heat measured in joules on the x-axis. I've added a thermometer on the left just to give you an intuition of how the temperature is increasing over time. The goal of using graphs in physics is to represent a lot of information that would be really painful to write out in words using pictures that are as simple as possible. We use temperature versus heat graphs to understand how the temperature of a material changes as we add heat, and we can find patterns in the graph that can tell us about the specific heats of the solid, liquid, and gas form of the material, and the latent heat of fusion and vaporization of the material, in addition to a lot of other information. So we're going to make a temperature versus energy graph for one kilogram of water that starts at negative 100 degrees Celsius and ends at positive 200 degrees Celsius. You can see I have a box with information about water, its specific heat as ice, water, and steam, and its latent heat of fusion and vaporization. I also have a box on the top right that's going to display what state of matter the water is in at each point along the graph. You can see I also have the two heat equations that we use when doing these types of calculations. When temperature is changing, we're going to use Q equals MC delta T, and when phase is changing, we're going to use Q equals M times L. I'm going to start by labeling important temperatures on the y-axis of the graph. First of all, I know that this water is starting off at negative 100 degrees Celsius. So in the top right, I know that its state of matter is going to begin as a solid. And I've lined that number up with this imaginary thermometer so you can get an intuition about how the temperature is changing. I know that zero degrees Celsius is the melting point of water. And the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. And the final temperature this water is going to reach is 200 degrees Celsius. I tried to space those out evenly so they represent equal increments, so this is the full range of my graph. This is where it's going to appear. So I'll begin to fill out any information that I know about this water. I know first of all that it's starting at a temperature of negative 100 degrees Celsius, so that's where the first point will be. And as we move to the right along the graph, the x-axis means that more and more heat is being added. So as heat is added to this water, I know that it won't be changing its phase because it's not at its melting point yet. And when temperature is changing, we can use Q equals MC delta T to understand the relationship between the heat and the temperature. I can see that the change in temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. That's how much the water is going to heat before it does something different, before it reaches its melting point and I have to use a different equation. I also know that its mass is one kilogram and the specific heat of water is 2.1 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. So if I bring all this information into my equation, I can use that to figure out exactly how much heat is going to be added over that increase of 100 degrees Celsius. When I do that calculation, I get 210,000 joules. So that means that as the temperature increases by 100 degrees Celsius, the water gains 210,000 joules. So I'll mark off a little point on my graph right there to mean that 210,000 joules have been added. Because you can see that neither T or Q are squared in this equation, and the mass and the specific heat stay constant, Q and delta T have a linear relationship with each other, so these graphs are always going to be linear. They'll always be straight lines like this if we're working in ideal situations. So I know that this graph would start at negative 100 degrees Celsius and increase linearly until it's zero degrees Celsius. It's at 210,000 joules of heat energy. So this gives me a visual of how much heat energy I need to add to increase its temperature by 100 degrees. And I know that over that time, the water is in its solid state. When the water hits zero degrees Celsius and continues to receive heat, it stops changing its temperature because it's at its melting point where it begins to change its phase instead. So it's going through the phase change fusion, which we know better as melting. When material is changing phase, we use Q equals ML to understand the relationship between the heat and the mass. And I can see that the latent heat of fusion for water is 3.3 times 10 to the fifth. So the total heat energy required for the full phase change is 330,000 joules. Because we're already at 210,000 joules, adding an additional 330,000 gets me to 540,000 joules. And during a phase change, the temperature does not change. All of the heat goes into changing the potential energy in the particles rather than the kinetic energy. So that means that the temperature remains constant as it changes its phase. Once the water is completely done changing its phase, it exists entirely as a liquid, and heat added goes back into changing the temperature. So we can now use that first equation to understand how much additional heat will have to be added to increase the temperature to 100 degrees Celsius, where the water begins to boil. So using Q equals MC delta T, I can see that my new change in temperature is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. So when I bring that information down, and I know that the specific heat of water is 4.2 times 10 to the third joules per kilogram degree Celsius, I can use that to find how much heat will be required to heat the water 
an additional 100 degrees Celsius. That turns out to be 420,000 joules. So altogether, that will be at a point of 960,000 joules. So this line represents how the temperature will increase over time. So this line represents the state of the water when it's in its liquid phase. The advantage of drawing these graphs is that I could look at any one point along that line and understand exactly how much energy the water had for any one point. If I wanted to know exactly how much heat had been added when the water was at 50 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Celsius, I could also use this graph to figure that out. When the water hits 100 degrees Celsius, the additional heat goes into changing its phase because now it's at its vaporization point. So when phase is changing, we use Q equals ML, and here L is the latent heat of vaporization, which is a very big number. Plugging that in gets me 2,300,000 joules, which is much bigger than the other numbers we've used so far, as you can see here. Adding that number to what I already had gets me a final number of 3,260,000 joules. And all through that time, while that heat is being added, the water is going through a phase change, so the temperature is not changing at all. So this line represents the water going through vaporization. Finally, the water is going to exist as a gas once it's been completely vaporized. And now that you know that, I'm actually going to get rid of the state of matter box just so I have a little more room. So in this last section of the graph, we're going from 100 degrees to 200 degrees Celsius. And because we're not changing phase anymore, we're changing temperature, so we're using Q equals MC delta T. I can see that the change in temperature will be 100 degrees Celsius to get us up to 200 degrees Celsius. Plugging that in, along with the specific heat of steam, gets me 200,000 joules of heat added to the water. That's how much heat will be required to get it up to 200 degrees Celsius. Altogether, I've now added 3,460,000 joules of heat energy to this water, and the water has now achieved 200 degrees Celsius, and it was a gas over that time. The reason why we like these graphs so much is that they can be used to find the energy required to heat a material from any temperature and phase to any temperature and phase. As an example, if we wanted to know how much energy it will require to completely evaporate ice that is frozen at zero degrees Celsius, if ice is frozen, it's completely in its solid state. So if it's a solid at zero degrees, the graph would have to start right here, right before it undergoes fusion. And the exact moment that it's completely evaporated will happen when vaporization is complete. So if I trace out how far it is from that point where it's a solid at zero degrees Celsius to the point where it's completely vaporized, I can see that the total energy added will be that final energy minus the energy that it started with. So the energy required to completely evaporate ice frozen at zero degrees Celsius, if there is just one kilogram of that ice, is 3,050,000 joules. We can rearrange Q equals MC delta T to fit Y equals MX plus B, so we can understand something about the slope. Q is the X value and delta T is the Y value, so if I rearrange it, I get delta T is equal to 1 over M times C, all multiplied by Q. And if I match that up with Y equals MX plus B, I can see that 1 over MC is equal to the slope, it's equal to the M value in MX plus B. So that means that the slope of this graph is always equal to 1 over the mass times the specific heat. And notice that because mass stays constant, a larger specific heat will mean a smaller slope. So if the line is steeper, that actually means you have a smaller specific heat. We can also observe how the potential and kinetic energy changes as energy is added over time. Just remember that changing temperature means the particles are gaining or losing kinetic energy, and changing phase means the particles are gaining or losing potential energy. So in every section where the water is gaining temperature, kinetic energy is being added, and wherever it's changing phase, potential energy is being added. So these are the places where kinetic and potential energy are being added respectively. So the energy that exists between each gap there is either going into kinetic energy or potential energy in the particles of the material. I can now trace through this entire graph and make a very detailed animation of what's happening to the temperature of the material, the state of the matter, the movement of the particles in the material, because remember, if you add internal kinetic energy, the particles begin to move faster. I can also show the bonds between the particles, and on the right, I'm going to graph the exact value of the energy of potential and kinetic energy as we go along the graph. So if we start at negative 100 degrees Celsius, the potential energy is very low because we're going to have to add that exact amount of potential energy to convert the material to water and then to steam. And like I said in a previous lecture, potential energy in the bonds of particles is recorded as negative. The water does have some kinetic energy already just because it's not at absolute zero. If you compared its energy from absolute zero to negative 100, you'd find that it's 3.6 times 10 to the fifth joules. So that's what I've recorded on the table on the right. So I'm just going to have you sit back and watch and observe what's happening to each value and each quality of the material as we trace along the graph. So the kinetic energy is increasing, the temperature is increasing, it's a solid, the movement of the particles is getting bigger. 
And then here the state of matter is changing, and so the potential energy is increasing, and the bonds between the particles are getting less strong. Then here more kinetic energy is being added, the temperature is increasing, the state of matter is constant as a liquid, and the particles are moving faster and faster, they're gaining more motion, and the bonds of the particles are remaining the same because the phase isn't changing. Then when we get to 100 degrees Celsius, the potential energy is increasing, it's going through vaporization, the temperature and kinetic energy and movement of the particles are all not changing. Finally, when all the negative potential has been removed, there are no bonds between the particles anymore, and the water now exists as gas, as steam. Finally, the energy added goes into kinetic energy, which increases the temperature of the water and the movement of the particles, and the water remains as steam. I'm going to play that one more time without narration, just to make sure you're taking in all the information. Any temperature versus heat graph can also be drawn as a temperature versus time graph if we assume a constant rate of power is being supplied to heat the material. As an example, we can imagine that we have a constant power supply of 100,000 watts, and we can ask how much time does it take to heat the water from negative 100 degrees Celsius to positive 200 degrees Celsius. Because power is heat over time, time is equal to heat over power. So for each value of heat I have on my x-axis, I can replace that with a value of time by just plugging it into time is equal to heat over power. This first number means that if you want to get to 210,000 joules and you're supplying 100,000 watts of power, it's going to take 2.1 seconds to supply that much heat. So that means that it takes 2.1 seconds for the water to hit its fusion state. It takes 5.4 seconds to reach this state, 9.6 seconds to reach this state, 32.6 seconds to reach this state, and 34.6 seconds to reach this state. So we no longer have a heat graph here, we have a temperature versus time graph. So temperature versus time graphs assume a constant rate of power being supplied. Now that we've built a temperature versus heat graph, I'm going to move into some general information that's true for any temperature versus heat graph. The phase changes obviously always appear at the temperatures of the melting point and the boiling point. The energy changes between each phase and in each phase are written on the x-axis. So each interval of energy is equal to that exact value. Just as a note, the x-axis can be read forward or backward. If we trace the graph backward, it means we are taking heat out of the material, so the material would experience condensation and freezing instead of fusion and vaporization. The amount of energy involved in a phase change is the same no matter which direction you're changing the phase. It's just that if you're moving to the left along the graph, that means that you're reducing the energy involved. So condensation reduces the energy by the same amount that vaporization increases it by. If we assume a constant power supply, we can rewrite those equations on the bottom as their heat equations divided by the power being supplied. That can tell us the time it takes to complete each process on the graph. The solid region is the point where the particles have the least kinetic and the least potential energy. With liquid, they have more kinetic and more potential, and in gas, they have the most kinetic and most potential. And just a reminder that potential in a gas is zero. The reason why that's the most is that the other phases have negative potential. We can compare different points along the phase changes and ask what's happening at each one. Right at the point where the material is in its solid phase but it's hitting its melting point is where it's still completely a solid but it's in its melting point. It's ready to be melted. At the halfway point between them, some of the material is solid and some of it is liquid, so it's not quite done with the phase change in either direction. And at the other end of the fusion freezing line, the material is still at its melting point but is now completely a liquid. And you can see there's a similar pattern when it's vaporizing or condensing. I'm going to give you a few examples of sections of the graph that correspond to specific descriptions. We could imagine that you're asked to describe the material that starts at a temperature A below the melting point, and heat is added to it until the exact moment it has completely evaporated. So on the graph that would look like this, there's some temperature A below the melting point, and this is the exact moment where it stops evaporating. So this section of the graph would be what the question is asking about. So you could find specific properties of the material over that time, for example, you could use the x-axis of the graph to find the total heat added, the total heat required to get from temperature A to the point where it's completely evaporated. In comparison, if we drew a line from temperature A to the exact point where the material begins to evaporate, it begins to evaporate here, right when the liquid reaches its boiling point, so this would involve a lot less energy than the other description. So this would be the total heat added there. We could say that the material starts at temperature A above the boiling point and emits heat, it's losing heat, until it's at temperature B between the melting and boiling point. So this could be where A is, this could be where B is, 
We would start here and there, and we could use this line to understand how much energy was physically lost. We could say the material begins as gas at its boiling point and emits heat until the exact moment it is completely solid. So this would be where the gas at its boiling point is, and the exact moment it becomes completely solid is right here at the end of its freezing state. So this would be the line we would draw, and this would be how much heat was lost. If you're given numbers on the axes of a temperature versus heat graph and asked to find the specific heat and latent heat of the material, you can use the fact that the horizontal length of a line on a graph is equal to the heat added and the vertical length is equal to the temperature change. As an example, we can imagine that the mass of the object being graphed is 2 kilograms and we want to know what is the material's latent heat of fusion and what is the material's specific heat in its liquid phase. I'll start by finding the latent heat of fusion. I know that that only applies in the fusion or freezing phase change, so I'm only going to pay attention to that. I can see that that phase change requires a total of 6 joules of energy, according to the x-axis, and the mass is 2, and we're trying to find the latent heat of fusion, so I know that this equation applies because it's a phase change. Isolating the latent heat of fusion gets me an answer of 3 joules per kilogram. So that would be the object's latent heat of fusion. And so we can get that just based off of the x-axis of the graph. Question B asks, what is the material's specific heat in its liquid form? So to understand specific heat, that only applies when temperature is changing. So I'm just going to look at the line where the temperature is changing and it's a liquid. Drawing that out, I can see that the change in heat is 7 joules. 7 joules are added from 8 to 15. The mass is 2 kilograms. The change in temperature is 40. It goes from 20 degrees to 60 degrees. And we're trying to find the specific heat. Plugging that into MC delta T gets me 0 0.088 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So that would be the specific heat. So again, we can find that just by using the graph to know the change in temperature on the y-axis and the heat on the x-axis. That's all the information that you need to know about how to read temperature versus heat graphs.